This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Great, and we're live. So welcome, and thank you to Cello Bello. Um, so I, I start, I uh, make a, um, a short introduction, and then uh, Guido will uh, talk. Uh, I prepared the, the, my speech because uh, it's in English, and for me it's not so easy. So um, we want to speak uh, about uh, Antonio Guida's uh, method for cello. And uh, this method was discovered by Guido Olivieri in the Jean Grey Hargrove Library, University of California, Berkeley. And the original title is uh, Sonate per il violoncello. Uh, this method was uh, written in the last quarter of the 18th century by Antonio Guida, who was teacher of cello and double bass at the Conservatory of Sant'Onofrio, Naples. Uh, before before going on with the, with the topic, uh, perhaps uh, uh, introduce um, Guido uh, Olivieri. Good morning from Austin, Texas. I'm Guido Olivieri. I'm a teacher of musicology at the University of Texas at Austin. And we are very excited today to uh, introduce you to some of the methodological approaches of the uh, Neapolitan school. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, yes. Um, uh, why uh, do we present this method? Because uh, uh, for the first time we have uh, a, a method about the uh, teaching of improvisation uh, for cello. Uh, this method is, is a true school of improvisation starting from the first to the composition with exercises for elaborating motifs, for improvising, um, pro improvising on the scale, and for training uh, those skills. Uh, indeed, if, if improvisation was an important and required skill to be considered a true virtuoso, it follows that it had to be taught, at least for professional musicians. Uh, we can thus consider this method as a very important tool to understand how the didactic of improvisation worked for cellists. Okay. Improvisation in classical music is a difficult topic. We all know that many great composers were also great improvisers, such as Johann Sebastian Bach or Mozart or Beethoven, Chopin. Uh, but today uh, this is a lost uh, art and only rare performers dare to improvise in concerts. In the performance practice of baroque music, today improvisation is practiced with ornamentation on the melody and adding chords to the line of the basso continuo, but usually cellists play the bass line like it's written. Practices like preluding or playing variations on themes are lost, unfortunately. Uh, in classical or romantic music, improvisation is almost absent. Uh, many ask themselves why this happens. In Cello Bell's channel, I watched many interesting videos and chats. In some, they ask why this practice has been lost. An answer is that over time, the role of the performer has changed, and what was a difficult but widespread practice included in the curriculum of studies today is a lost art. My aim is to talk about historical improvisation at the cello, about the researches I made thanks to some new sources, but above all thanks to the many scholars who already afforded the topic of historical improvisation, mostly for keyboard, and thanks in particular to the musicologist Guido Olivieri. He's a great scholar of the instrumental Baroque music in Naples, and he wrote also about some great cellists of that time. In a while, he will tell us about the development of the cello in Naples as Guida's method comes after a century with very interesting histories of cello and cellists. I would, uh, I would now like to move on to the heart of the matter 
and describe some main features and topics of Guida's method. Uh, and uh, I want to show my screen and show something. Just uh, a couple of minutes. Let's see. Uh, okay, can, uh, can you see? Uh, I have to... Just a moment. Um, okay, so go on here. Uh, this is the frontispiece of the manuscript. And this is a table with the content of uh, the method. And uh, here um, we... Giovanna, for, for some reason, is, is showing still the first uh, slide. Uh, okay. If you uh, can go back. Yes. Uh, so... Uh... Just a moment, I'm sorry, I, I try again. Um, I don't know, I have to, to this one. Um, um, just a moment. We made a, okay. Is it is it uh, is the uh, no? It's the fourth um, button from from the from the bottom right, next to the, the zoom slider. Uh, can you see it now? Uh, we still see the um, the presentation not in presentation mode, but perhaps you can go through the through the slides even in this way. Okay. I think it's fine. Uh, so here, uh, here we see um, a table with the um, contents of the volume. Uh, um, the interesting thing for us uh, as we are speaking of um, improvisation are uh, the eight paired exercises uh, um, on the rule of the octave, uh, which I will explain later. And uh, uh, it, uh, um, four pairs of cello duets so we see here um, in paired voices uh, which are exercises to train the skills but uh, in reality uh, improvisation starts from the beginning from the beginning um, can you see now the exercise number two um I, giovanna i think you might need to advance to the second slide on the with the thumb thumbnails to the left Guido, help me. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, uh, I think that uh, the presentation mode is not starting. Um, so. Um, oh, I, I, uh, I'm out, and I, I try again. Uh, let's, let's see if this time uh, it works. Altrimenti puoi mandarmelo e, e... Okay, now we are, we are good. Exercise number two. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is the exercise number two. So we are uh, at the beginning, uh, really at the beginning of the method, and we have already uh, an exercise with uh, uh, improvisation in, in uh, which sense? That we see uh, there are some uh, um, modules or pattern repeated each bar. Uh, this pattern is uh, in uh, green here, is uh, composed of uh, four notes and is repeated on each degree of the scale um, and um, uh, ascending we have a, a scale step uh, by step and descending we see here is a scale in third and at the end uh, there is a cadence and this is typical of all uh, Guida's the exercises which are little pieces of music. Now I, um, I close the, the, the sharing and uh, I play just two minutes this uh, first exercise, which is very simple, but I think it's, it, it is also very important. And we have uh, the, the scale, we all know the, the C major scale. On each degree of the scale, we have this uh, four notes pattern. So we have the and uh, descending uh, it's 
scale in thirds, so. <laughs> of the book and this mean, it means that the uh, diminution which is uh, strictly uh, related to improvisation was taught from really from the uh, beginning now I go on uh, uh, a while um, so the main characteristic of this method is the presence of a large number of studies aiming at the development of improvisatory skills uh, uh, we have uh, just uh, seen together with the exercises devoted to specific aspects such as the study of positions and clefs and short pieces in a short time uh, we can see all the aspects of guida's teaching method uh, but we have to say that the, uh, this modern principle is present from uh, the start as we have uh, seen and uh, heard now um, uh, this uh, uh, number two, this exercise number two, uh, is only the beginning, as the most interesting part of the method lies in the exercises on the scale. And now I will play the first exercise on the scale. Uh, we, in the method, uh, it's the number exercise uh, uh, number 15A. And today I have the help of Eugenio Di Nito which is my son, and he is a cello student of uh, Professor Luca Franzetti in the Conservatory of Reggio Emilia. So we, we play now the number 15A, which is the first exercise on the scale, and then I will show the image and uh, pass the testimony to Guido. was uh, played at the beginning uh, by the teacher has some uh, diminutions in this case diminutions uh, uh, means uh, a, a particular shape of a um, broken chord or arpeggio and so now um, let me see I, I wanted to I want you to, to share I, I try again I hope to be more lucky um, I try again to show uh, can you see the, the presentation? Yes. Ah, fantastic. I'm very happy. But it doesn't move. Uh, I'll try here from here. Can you see now this uh, number 15? Yes. Okay. So this is what we, we played uh, before. And um, on each degree of the scale, uh, in the first voice, uh, we see there are um, eight notes. And these uh, notes uh, are chosen um, with the help of the rule of the octave, and I will explain this uh, later. So now I pass the testimony to Guido Olivieri. Thank you so much, Joanna. Wonderful introduction to this great method of Antonio Guida. That is a method that comes um uh, in in a manuscript that belongs to the late 18th century so we have this uh, school of improvisation right this uh, method of improvisation that arrives at um at the late in the late 18th century and during throughout the entire century we find um the presence of numerous um virtuosi uh, neapolitan virtuosi that really established, developed, 
and spread the methodology, the pedagogical approaches, as well as the virtuosity that they developed in, uh, uh, in Naples. We have names that are very um, well known, I think, to, to cello players, Francesco Alborea, uh, Francesco Paolo Supriani, Caporale, and Salvatore Lanzetti. These are all only a few names of the most famous virtuosi uh, who came from Naples and um, developed uh, their career and, and spent their time in uh, major European capitals like Vienna, London, Paris. We'll talk a little bit just quickly about them in a moment. But um, we need to uh, step back in time, in a sense, and look at the roots of this development and this uh, spread and diffusion of the Neapolitan cello school. And we knew very little about this uh, tradition until uh, a, a few years ago, in, in reality. Uh, the hint that there was a very well-established and important school of, of cello playing in Naples uh, comes, among other uh, evidence, comes from a manuscript that um, was uh, known before but never studied with, with much attention. Um, and this is a, a manuscript source uh, that is still preserved in a beautiful original binding as you can see from the image here and i hope that you can see everything fine um the that is coming from the library in um, of the monte cassino abbey and this manuscript is dated one one of the collections that are included in this manuscript is dated 1699 so we are toward the end of the 17th century and it is a very important um, source because it, it includes at least uh, includes four collections, four sets of uh, music that um, really have a particular significance for the history of the early cello, not only in Naples. Uh, the first group is a couple of um, cello sonatas or sinfonias, uh, sinfonie, as in, in the original uh, manuscript uh, is indicated, they are indicated uh, by Giovanni Bononcini. And uh, Bononcini, we know uh, him as a uh, one of the most famous opera composers of the of the 18th century, active in uh, originally uh, from Modena, but active in uh, in uh, Rome and Vienna, and then in London uh, as a rival of Handel. But um, he was also one of the most important virtuosi of the, of the century, to the point that uh, Correct in his treatise called him, called Bononcini, the inventor of the cello. Of course, it is an exaggeration, but it, it tells us how important he was as a virtuoso uh, performer and, um, and a composer for the cello. Uh, now, the importance of these two symphonie that I have uh, published and are open access and uh, uh, accessible to the, to the link that I'm showing is certainly historical because um, we didn't have any, um, with the exception of one single sonata by Giovanni Bononcini that was attributed to him, probably very uh, doubtful. Uh, these are the first two um, sonatas by him. But it, there is also another important aspect. We usually, uh, traditionally, have put the origin of the cello in uh, centers of northern Italy, like Bologna or Modena. And, uh, and that's certainly true, but Bononcini and the presence of these two sonatas in the uh, this manuscript source that is of Neapolitan origins demonstrates the fact that there was a link, probably at least hint to these links between Modena and Bologna, the cello school established there uh, in the early 17th century, and the cello school of Naples. This Monte Cassino source include also, includes also uh, the largest collection of passagagli for the cello, 10 
Passacaglia for, um, for the cello by Gaetano Francone, who was another important um, teacher and uh, cello player in Naples um, in the second half of the 17th century. He was string teacher at one of the conservatories, the conservatory of Sant'Onofrio. And this is the largest collection of passacaglias that we have for the cello uh, that, that we know of. Uh, so it, it's a very important collection uh, in which uh, that, that has been uh, published also uh, in collaboration with, with Giovanna uh, and uh, shows how uh, Francone elaborates and um, uh, creates diminutions and uh, really patterns of improvisation over the uh, constant repetition of this very simple passacaglia pattern. In this case, it's, it's really formed by uh, the one, four, five, one uh, grades of the of degree of the scale. And uh, this manuscript includes also um, two collections by Rocco Greco. Rocco Greco is the um, brother of the more famous, probably Gaetano Greco, very important uh, pedagogue and teacher in uh, in Naples. Rocco Greco was a, a cello player and a teacher of cello uh, at the Poveri di Gesù Cristo, another conservatory in Naples. But also he entered um, at the service of the Royal Chapel in Naples uh, at the end of in, in 1698. Uh, now, these are collections, this, this first collection, as you can see, bears the date of 1699, is a collection of sonatas for, two, for due viole, two viola, but uh, the, the term viola, um, uh, I, I have described all the evolution and changes in uh, terminology in a recent article, uh, the term viola does not certainly indicate the viola da gamba nor the alto viola. It's a term that um, designate a probably a slightly larger uh, instrument that was uh, most of the time tuned a step lower than the modern uh, cello tuning. And we need to consider uh, something that um, might already uh, be well known to, to many of you, but uh, that the standardization of the cello uh, in, the, in the modern uh, measurements and, and tuning is something that happened uh, relatively late in the 18th century and probably even uh, later in the 19th century. So we are still in, at this time in a, in a time of uh, um, experimentation, if you like, but also in the presence of a variety of instruments and tuning that were adapted to the, to the repertory. So these are uh, collections that are very important, uh, all these collections that are included in this manuscript, because they show the presence of this cello uh, school and tradition. I, I use the term school because there was a transmission of knowledge from one generation to the other through the important, of course, the, the most important pedagogical centers, the four old conservatories in Naples, where, um, as we know by uh, a very important uh, scholarly work that has been done uh, on this, um, students were taught partimenti, they learned uh, counterpoint, the learned solfeggio. So all students, not only keyboard um, players, learned about these fundamentals, these pillars of, of knowledge. And, uh, and of course, in the four conservatories, we have the presence of uh, string players, string teachers, uh, teachers that were teaching not only cello, but also double bass, as well as violin. Most of them were violinists, actually. And we know that this school became extremely important uh, in Naples, but also throughout Europe. We have documents um, attesting the fact that some 
um, students were sent actually, for example, from Vienna to learn cello at um, the Neapolitan uh, conservatories. Um, the presence of the cello is, of course, we have documents of, of the uh, presence of this instrument uh, in the Royal Chapel and uh, starting the, in the very early 18th century, we have also uh, the term uh, violoncello used for the first time in the, in the um, Royal Chapel. Here is a beautiful image that I usually show because it's a rare image of the um, uh, Royal Chapel in uh, accompanying the procession of the Viceroy, uh, where you can see the cello in, uh, in the first um, place here, uh, played, we don't know, probably at that point, possibly also as a solo uh, instrument. Uh, but the presence, uh, constant presence in, uh, in the Royal Chapel as an instrument that could accompany, for example, uh, Aries became really important already from the 1690s and then later in the 18th centuries we have arias for one or two uh, violoncelli obbligati in uh, uh, works by Handel, by Leo. So a very important presence. A presence that is connected again with, uh, with the work of some of these um, virtuosi and one of the uh, probably less known but very important virtuoso in Naples was Francesco Paolo Supriani, who um, studied in Naples and then entered the, the Royal Chapel and moved for a certain for a few years in Barcelona. Uh, he became the cello, the first cello of the chapel in Barcelona, the chapel established by Archduke Charles, the future Emperor Charles VI. Uh, and Francesco Paolo Supriani is nowadays maybe less known as a virtuoso, but uh, should be very well known as uh, the author of what is, uh, I would argue, at least what, as far as we know at this point, the earliest uh, Italian uh, tutor for the cello, the Principi da imparare a suonare il violoncello, prin principles to learn how to play the violoncello in which he explains very quickly uh, some, uh, some uh, fundamentals of, of the cello and then uh, puts together 12 toccate for the cello. What is interesting, and I show a couple of images and uh, we will have uh, also a, a demonstration uh, a pl playing uh, uh, on, on this um, specific toccata. Uh, what is interesting in these uh, two manuscripts that are left by um, Supriani is that we have the original toccatas, for example here you see um, the toccata quinta and I apologize for the uh, the copy is not one of the best uh, and, and more uh, most visible copies but you can see a toccata that some, some of them elaborate on specific uh, technical aspects. But then we have another manuscript in which the original toccata appears on the top line, but we have also, uh, Supriani added a bass line uh, on, on the bottom and a third line in between, which is really an elaboration and diminution in some cases of the original toccata. Uh, so it is very, very uh, interesting and um, uh, is a precious um, testimony of how a cello composer, cello player and, and virtuoso at the time could elaborate, it, elaborate uh, starting from an original composition, elaborate some variations and diminutions. I, I think uh, uh, we can, uh, I stop sharing, we can listen to this uh, quinta, toccata quinta with elaborations from Giovanna and Eugene. Hello, 
Yes, I, we prepared uh, only the first bars, or otherwise we, we, we can speak about Guida. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yes, as, uh, as Guido said before, um, first there was the Toccata for Cello Solo uh, and then there was the version with diminutions uh, for the solo and the uh, basso continuo. Now we will play uh, both solutions of the solo with the continuo. So first, uh, the simple uh, uh, voice with the continuo. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so you you uh, can really hear at this point uh, how this uh, pedagogical approach, right? This this approach to the elaboration to the improvisation uh, over a, a pattern or over an original melody was developed in Naples. And uh, so after that, of course, we have. Uh, some methods by Salvatore Lanzetti, for example. But um, to go back to our uh, focus today, uh, Antonio Guida um, is coming, in a sense, in the wake of this large, long tradition. And uh, it has a particular importance for the way in which he develops in this manuscript that uh, uh, we have found the, a, a true school of improvisation. So I, I hope that giving these flashes on the uh, history of um, Neapolitan cello tradition or Neapolitan cello school, we can uh, uh, appreciate even a little more the work that is uh, included in this important uh, method by Antonio Guida. And uh, we listen now to more details about this from Giovanna. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Guido, for your wonderful uh, presentation. It's uh, really, Naples is full, full of um, great virtuoso, virtuosos, virtuosi, and fantastic music for cello. And um, before we played the number uh, 15A, which was the first of the exercise on the scale and I will explain uh, in a while uh, how they work and now uh, I would like to play the, um, the last one uh, with the uh, virtuoso uh, motifs uh, which is the number uh, 24A uh, I will play the, ascending, the part on the ascending scale exercises on this scale uh, um, works uh, both on uh, um, instrumental uh, technique and uh, on uh, composition at directly at the instrument. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the eight paired exercises on this scale show 
and increasing uh, difficulty. Uh, and the goal of uh, these exercises was that the pupils first memorizing these models and transposing them could after invent the, their own solutions. And uh, probably uh, these exercises uh, were performed uh, first uh, like we did uh, now with the pupil playing uh, the bass line, uh, so the simple scale, and uh, later um, changing uh, roles, so with the, with the um, uh, teacher playing the scale and the pupil uh, the um, diminutions. Thank you, Eugenio. Um, we can rest a bit. Um, um, what uh, uh, could the cellist do after learning all uh, these skills? Um, a cellist could uh, uh, add, um, could uh, improvise, for example, a, a bass uh, under a melody or a melody uh, over a bass line. And uh, um, there were uh, two different possibilities or playing uh, uh, a melody, so a, si a simple melody uh, with uh, a counterpoint uh, um, uh, way of elaborating or uh, using uh, patterns um, like these ones uh, we, um, we uh, listen to um, now. Uh, so now I would like uh, I, um, to try again to share my screen. I hope I will be more lucky because I prepared some slides uh, because I, I would like also to explain how um, the exercises uh, work. Let me see if I can uh, now succeed. Uh, can you see now? Yes. Okay. I'm very happy for that. So we go on. This was the um, first uh, we played. And now, let me see. Can you see the, the, new, the new slide? Yes, it's working. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so um, I change uh, for a moment uh, uh, the focus because uh, um, I, I suppose that not, uh, not all, all uh, uh, Cellists know exactly what is a basso continuo uh, because in the exercises on the scale, the scale is, um, uh, works as a uh, basso continuo. Um, we have to remember that in Baroque music there is always a line at the bottom called basso continuo, which includes only a single line, sometimes with figures, sometimes without figures. Uh, the numbers we can see on the notes uh, here um, we have on the first two examples. This line can be played by various instruments according to the historical practice and to the specific situation. For example, here the first, uh, the first uh, example is uh, uh, music for uh, chorus and orchestra, so the uh, basso continuo is played by, by many instruments together, bassoon, cello, organ, uh, lute, uh, lute uh, harp, etc. Uh, instead, in uh, Telemann, um, we have only one instrument playing the melody, it, it's so that um, at the bass line, uh, we'll have uh, only one instrument, for example, a cello or a bassoon, in case that there is a flute, or also a cello uh, with uh, the harpsichord. And the third example is uh, from uh, Vivaldi, and uh, I want you to put it because we see there are no uh, numbers uh, or figures, or they are called the number of figures. Um, this uh, means that the uh, harpsichord player or the, the, the cello player um, uh, had to know uh, how to uh, put chords on uh, these uh, notes put chords or put uh, a melody, uh, it depends, it is uh, an, open, uh, an open question today also in uh, musicology. Uh, quickly, uh, we see here um, the frontispiece of uh, um, Arcangelo Corelli, Sonata Evelino Opus 5, which is a very known masterpiece. And uh, I wanted to, to share this, um, this image because it's written Sonate a violino e violone o cimbalo. That means that uh, uh, that line, the continual line, uh, can be played according to this, um, to this uh, uh, frontispiece written by uh, Corelli uh, 
um, played by the violone or by the cembalo uh, and not uh, uh, not um, uh, it's not uh, obliged we are not obliged to, to play together uh, with the cembalo and uh, there is an, an image uh, a little image a very nice in which we see that uh, the um, dimension of the cello is uh, it's not, the cello is not uh, so big here. Uh, it's called violone, but uh, the instrument is not so big. So there is a, uh, still an open question about uh, uh, the names and the shapes of the cello. And uh, in the end, there, there will be a bibliography um, uh, with the articles uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, this problem, how, um, how uh, the instruments were called and uh, um, which uh, shapes they had. Uh, so now we uh, go back to the um, exercise on the scale. I try to go quickly because I prepared many things and the uh, time is running. Um, we have here only uh, the, um, the part of the scale. Uh, we see there, uh, there is uh, only a little uh, uh, rhythmic uh, diminution and this helps to, to, take, uh, to, to, to be always uh, on time. And so the question is, uh, how uh, can we put something over the scale? Um, how it works? So we go on and are prepared. Um, this is the first step. So we can uh, put on the uh, scale um, one note uh, over uh, one note. This is called the simple counter counterpoint. And uh, mm, the rule is that all notes uh, must be consonants. And we see here, I put uh, uh, the number of the consonants. For example, we start with an octave, then we have a sixth, then again an octave. It, it's interesting because we see there are some unison and there is a crossing here. Here, uh, there is a crossing. Um, and this is the start, the start of uh, uh, playing over the bass line. Um, how can we uh, choose uh, the other notes that we want to put? We, we don't want to play only one note for, for one bar, but we want to play many notes. And uh, there was a rule uh, used by all the musicians, uh, uh, not only in Naples, not, not only in Italy, and uh, this rule was called the rule of the octave. And uh, uh, this rule uh, gave to each note of uh, the scale a harmony or chord or a number. And uh, for example, here we have Francesco Durante's rule of the octave, which uh, is the, the same used by Antonio Guida. So we say that uh, uh, we see here that uh, each, uh, um, uh, each note of the bass line to each note corresponds a chord. A chord is uh, um, uh, showed by a number. And we go on. And so here uh, I added to uh, the exercise number 15 as we played uh, before. As we played it, um, I put the numbers according to the harmony. Uh, for example, at the beginning on the G, we have a um, perfect um, chord. On the second, on the A, we have a uh, uh, first, uh, uh, how do you say in English, uh, primo rivolto, first inversion. And uh, I wrote also the, uh, the name of the chords, uh, which perhaps are useful for people we, which are not so used to, to the um, numbers of the basso continuo. And uh, we can see that there are some uh, chords uh, which are repeated many times. Uh, for example, we have many G, ma G major and uh, uh, a minor and D major, which, which are the most important uh, chords of this uh, uh, key. Uh, and this is to explain uh, how the rule of the octave um, uh, was used to, um, uh, to put harmony very quickly on uh, a bass line. So we go, we go on. Uh, we go on because uh, um, uh, that notes uh, we see here the the, the eight notes uh, for our eyes uh, they are a broken chord so we immediately think to a chord to a vertical element of uh, music instead in uh, that time in the baroque times 
um, they, they thought it as a, um, a melodic element, in that case a melodic element formed by um, notes of the chord. Uh, just one slide to uh, talk about uh, diminution, uh, because uh, this, uh, um, uh, this uh, um, uh, way of uh, putting many notes uh, uh, on the place of one longer note, many uh, shorter notes, is called diminution. And here is the, the um, definition of uh, the Grove Music uh, Dictionary. Um, uh, what is diminution? Diminution is a melodic figure that replaces a long note with notes of shorter value. And as an example, I put it here um, uh, one, uh, one little example from uh, Diego Ortiz, Trattato de Glosas, uh, which is uh, written for uh, violone. And uh, in, uh, we have uh, at the beginning, in the first bar, two um, minims, two uh, half notes. And then we see uh, uh, at the place of the first minimum uh, we have uh, um, many uh, different uh, solutions with the shorter values. Uh, here is a table um, in which uh, I put uh, all the um, motifs uh, um, used by Guida, uh, proposed by Guida on, in the exercises on the scale. And uh, I put together all the modules uh, in uh, uh, binary time, um, reducing, just posing all, uh, uh, all them in the same key, which is G, G minor or G major, it depends. And this is to show how all the different patterns uh, um, that he de that we de develops on the scale are all very strictly uh, related to the first one, which is the number 15A that we uh, played before. Um, what can we do uh, when uh, uh, we, we learn? We learn to improvise uh, those patterns. Uh, we can play something, uh, for example, as I said before, uh, under a melody. So I, I chose a very, very simple melody, uh, the one from Mozart, A uh, vous je dirai maman. Um, he, he prepared the 12 uh, variations on this um, very simple theme. And uh, uh, I prepared a variation uh, which I will play now with the help of Eugenio. So now I um, stop the sharing and play this uh, little uh, little, uh, very, very little um, thing. And uh, um, to accompany this uh, very uh, simple melody, I, cho I chose uh, a pattern from the exercise 23B by Guida. So first uh, we will play um, the 23, only, only the first uh, three bars. And then, uh, uh, je vous dirai maman, uh, with the, um, this pattern applied to the bass. So now it's the 23B. Okay, this is just, just to have an idea of uh, uh, of how of how um, uh, Guida elaborates uh, uh, this uh, this scale in C major, and uh, Je vous dirai maman is uh, also in C major, so we, it's easier for us. Um,
come back to the presentation. Um, I come back to the presentation because I have a, a little surprise. Let's see. Okay. okay, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Okay. So this uh, this is the beginning of uh, Mozart's uh, work. Uh, at the beginning, uh, he uses a very very simple um, counterpoint. Uh, instead, uh, after uh, after he uses something uh, more elaborated. Uh, here we see the uh, 23 by Guida um, that we played before. That we, these, these are the three bars we played before. And here I, I, um, I show how uh, this uh, um, pattern is built. And I will quickly, uh, this is what we played before. And this is Mozart and the, variation, the variations number 2 and uh, 12. Uh, it's not exactly uh, like uh, uh, the Guida, Guida's one, but it's very similar with a, a longer part, which is uh, always repeated the same, and with the first note with, uh, which changes and uh, belongs to the chord. It was here. And now to, to close, we have prepared um, a variation on uh, the duets for paired uh, voice. This is the number uh, 25A, uh, this is the first. Um, you can see it's a, a very, very simple exercise. It's strange because after all uh, um, that virtuoso music, it's strange uh, why uh, he, uh, he puts these exercises here. And uh, our, our idea is that this is, uh, uh, this is uh, an exercise for training. So um, perhaps this, uh, this was uh, used uh, to apply diminutions. Uh, we can see that uh, it, it is uh, composed in um, invertible uh, uh, counterpoint, so that uh, what one voice uh, uh, plays at one moment uh, can be repeated after. So now we play this and this is the last, uh, the last little piece we play. So um, I... I I close the sharing. Uh, we will play now the 25A only um, one part, and then the same exercise uh, uh, with some uh, diminutions. So first, this is the first the simple, simple version, which which is the that one that uh, Guida uh, wrote. presentation are taken from the introduction to the method published by Sedman and from the article written together with Guido Olivieri published by Studi Musicali in the second volume of uh, um, uh, last year who is interested in historical uh, improvisation at the cello or at the melodic instrument uh, I wanted to say this that uh, um, can 
reached me and Catherine Ban, a colleague from New York, with whom I'm collaborating next summer at uh, Partimenti Vaso. Um, so now, uh, just the last, uh, last uh, quickly, the last um, uh, slide, and then I, I saw there are some. Uh, echo. These, these are the um, uh, the frontispiece of uh, mm, the editions of um, Guida, uh, Francone, the article Studi Musicali, and um, there is the um, uh, advertising for for the summer course. So uh, this is all, and uh, uh, Guido will share his uh, bibliography after. And I see there are some uh, questions. Yeah, there are. Thank you, Giovanna. There are many questions uh, we will try to answer uh, in, in the order we receive them. I saw at the very beginning a question um, about performance improvisation on violin, actually, violin pedagogy for performance improvisation in Naples. Uh, I can answer uh, fairly quickly about that. This, this is a, f a field that we are trying to uh, revive and rediscover through uh, the study of the sources. And to be honest, um, the study on instrumental music in Naples has been very um, uh, it's been forgotten for many, many years and only in the perhaps two last two decades we are starting to uh, revive this. So there is one manuscript that I'm studying currently that probably includes some ideas on improvisation and pedagogy of this for the violin, but uh, not um, anything as sub substantial as for the cello. And then I think we have another question, right? The second question from Timothy. How does one integrate ornamentation with this method of improvisation? Could you please outline the rules and conventions necessary to do so? Giovanna, I think that... Uh, I think we, we demonstrate a bit, uh, I tried to de demonstrate a bit how uh, it worked and how uh, one can practice uh, adding diminutions to simpler exercises. <laughs> and the rules uh, are many rules, and it's very, very. It's a very complicated topic. We tried now to to be short and quick, but uh, it's not so. But, but on the other side, uh, on the other end, if I'm uh, correct, and please uh, correct me, uh, there are rules, but there are also rules that are learned through performance through application of those. So there are not uh, the the difference between the modern methodology and methods. And the 18th century methods is not that you have really, yes. you elaborate this, uh, any, any explanation, you learn by doing. Exactly. Uh, I think um, that Guida's method is very important for this because uh, he, he, um, it shows uh, uh, in a practical way how uh, directly at the instrument you learn this, you learn uh, uh, to apply diminutions, uh, you learn to elaborate motives uh, on uh, a scale, and you and you train uh, you train uh, all these uh, from the beginning until uh, the end, the the very virtuosic um, uh, skills. Uh, I I read the the, the following maybe. Uh from Marta, do you have any thoughts and tips on how to improvise with this method, I guess, uh, through different modulations? Uh, modulations? So, uh, what does it mean? Uh, uh, changing, key, changing keys? Yeah, I think, I think yes. Uh, um, in this method, uh, he, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, um, focus very much, focuses very much on uh, uh, modulations. And uh, um, for for early didactic, um, it was very important first to be able to uh, to invent to create many different things on the same key, and after after that you could do this, uh, you started to modulate because uh, a modulation is already a variation because uh, with changing key you you change uh, uh, the sounds. So before you had to to be really well acquainted with. Uh, with all these uh, skills. Then a question from Andrew, which is a big one. Can you post a brief list of recommended reading for historical informed performance? Uh, 
Um, you know, we we focused on Naples because this is uh, the the place where this pedagogical approaches by Guida was developed. There is a huge uh, bibliography on historical informed performance. Uh, maybe I can suggest as a really first step, but uh, it's it's just a, a short introduction by uh, Lawson. Uh, it, it is called the Introduction to Historical Performance Practice. It is a book that very small book, but contains all the main things, and then. Uh, it has already 20 years, so it's not really updated, but uh, from there you can start building up. I don't know, um, Giovanna, if you have uh, recommendations uh, perhaps, in general. Uh, perhaps, yes, yes, a, a very good uh, site, uh, which is uh, earlysources.com, which uh, mm -hmm. is um, very well um, organized and uh, it, uh, it's on YouTube. Um, it proposes uh, short videos, uh, each one on a, a topic with a, a long uh, uh, bibliography uh, under. So Great. And there are also Facebook uh, groups you can join uh, where, where there is discussion about historical informed performance. From Luis, uh, did Antonio Guida have any thoughts on how to vary uh, articulation and pacing through improvisation? think that uh, what now we see as uh, exercises for the bow uh, before they were taught as um, as uh, variations uh, so um, perhaps for um, for this kind of uh, of method of uh, the approach to ch to teaching it's the same you you learn to vary and uh, in in the same time you learn different uh, bowings i don't know if this was the the question yeah or um, I mean uh, it, it's also uh, if there are indications on how to apply maybe uh, this these different patterns to different uh, um, situations different you know uh, uh, piece of music or function is there a, a systematic I don't think that there is a, a systematic approach on this it's uh, it's yeah, really uh, he doesn't uh, deal very much on uh, on Boeings. Yeah, no. Right, right. But it, it is a way to develop this ability of improvising on any um, pattern of the scale, so that you can introduce then this this kind of uh, diminutions in uh, in in your actual music, as you wonderfully de demonstrated with with uh, Mozart and with the duet. Right, you can you can. Uh, once you have learned the tools, you can apply those to, to various works, right? Yep. Oh, that one integrate diminutions with canons. But usually canons are not diminished, otherwise uh, you change uh, you change the motive. Uh, uh, the, ca the canon, uh, uh, because you, in the canon you have to follow strictly, otherwise uh, it's not a canon. No? What do you think, Guido? Uh, well, I think strictly speaking, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a, a very uh, strict and, and uh, uh, almost rigid right, form of, of counterpoint. Uh, on the other side, I mean, you, you can, uh, you, you have de demonstrated a little bit with the duet, right, where you have invertible uh, parts and invertible counterpoints, how you can improvise there the the teacher is improvising uh, right elaborations and then the student is imitating those right yes so that that is is i mean with canons becomes extremely difficult uh, but uh, but in counterpoint uh, th this is a system that could work mm -hmm. steven asks uh, what are a few core principles with this method you would encourage cellists to focus on in the practice room uh, it's difficult because uh, you ha I have to say in two words everything. <laughs> um, uh, for me, the, the, the one of the um, most important things that I learned studying this method is that uh, um, we can work with music from the beginning. Uh, so um, in Guida they are not uh, strictly speaking uh, um, mechanical exercises. Uh, they are always uh, little pieces of music. 
Um, and so this is a, a, a good principle um, so that you, um, you grow up uh, making music from the, uh, from the beginning. Uh, for example, um, I showed uh, in the exercise number two, uh, which was about applying only one pattern to a scale, so a very, very simple and mechanical exercise. It ended with a cadence, so there was a, um, a speech ending with a, a, a beautiful uh, close. And uh, for me, this is, a, I repeat, a very important uh, point. And uh, another point is that we can, uh, as, as also Guido was uh, saying before, uh, we can uh, um, learn composition at the instrument. And this, this was the uh, specific uh, um, uh, approach, uh, didactic approach uh, of the Neapolitan school. At the instrument you learn, in Guida we, we see, uh, it, it's, a, it's a long uh, topic, uh, we, here we, we had no time to, to, to see in detail, but uh, um, the exercises from the scale, uh, we, we saw the first, uh, the first um, arpeggios, uh, they were all uh, uh, triads, simple triads, after he, he adds suspensions, he adds uh, uh, changes of harmonies, he, he, he adds uh, uh, sevens, so dissonances, many, many kinds of dissonances. And so while, uh, while you uh, uh, learn uh, to um, apply uh, patterns, you learn harmony and in the same time you learn uh, technique because uh, uh, the, the patterns uh, become uh, increasingly uh, more virtuosic. Great, yes, um, absolutely. We, we can probably stop, we should stop here with uh, very wonderful questions. Uh, from my side, I would uh, just underline the importance of this school and, and of the uh, rediscovery of this repertory and how uh, we can really, through historical sources, we can um, apply those methods and those approaches even to modern uh, uh, technical uh, uh, you know performance and especially for those who are interested in historical performance practice i think that this is very important and from my point of view is part of the rediscovery of the instrumental important instrumental tradition in naples um, I, I don't know giovanna what, what do you think um, I agree. <laughs> sure. I agree. Um, I don't know. Um, but I, I yeah, think it's so much to say and uh, in so so a few a few time. Uh, I hope that um, we 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 move the, the audience uh, towards this uh, this uh, approach to didactic uh, to uh, this repertoire to this uh, to those uh, cellists which were really great. Great. Thank you. Thank you.